A relationship with the right referral partner could be a game changer for any B2B company. So what if you could reverse engineer these relationships at a moment's notice? Start a podcast. Invite potential referral partners to be guests on your show and grow your referral network faster than ever. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivey. I've got here with me today, Chris Ronzio, founder and CEO of Trainual. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Nikki. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited. There's so much that we've got to go over. We're going to be talking about how improving your training and onboarding process can be the key uh, differentiator to scaling a successful B2B business. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about what uh, your background is and what you and the folks at Trainual have been up to these days. Awesome. Yeah. So my background started when I was 14. I started my first company. It was a video production company. And we went from shooting weddings and corporate videos and commercials to eventually having an event production business that did events in 50 states around the US with 300 camera operators and three offices. And so training and systems and processes were so crucial to me growing that business. When I sold that business, I started consulting, working with other companies, and I really found that training and systems were the key to getting the owner out of the business and the key to getting each employee to maximize their potential in the business. Because if you are stuck doing the thing you're doing today forever, then you're never going to grow. And so I saw training as the catalyst to help people grow. So little by little, these seeds were planted in my head and the idea for Trainual kind of percolated out of that. And so Trainual is an online tool where you can document all the processes and policies in your business, split them up so you've got clear roles and responsibilities, train people when you hire them, and then keep them up to speed as things change. So it's a, it's one tool to kind of manage the brain of the business. It's so important. I, I love it. I mean, as a person who I've been an individual contributor at a few uh, SaaS startups here in Austin, and the ones that, that get it right are the ones that have a, a sort of culture of training and sort of make that central to, to what they're doing to scale their business. Um, and that kind of leads us into the first big idea that, that I want you to talk about. You have this motto, do it, document it, delegate it. Dig into that a little bit for us and let us know how that sort of informs what you're doing over there at Trainable. Yeah, so this is the framework that everything was based on. As I looked back in the consulting work I was doing, I had worked with about 150 companies, all different industries, all different company sizes, but there were some companies that just took off. They would have, they would go from three people to 300 people. And there were other companies that were just kind of stuck where they were at, or maybe they didn't want to grow any bigger than where they were at. So as I looked at the companies that really scaled, I saw the one commonality was that they followed this sort of formula. And so do it, document it, delegate. It just means that if you can learn to do something consistently, if you get really good at doing it so that it's very repeatable, you're doing it by memory, but at least you're doing it consistently. Then the step to getting out of doing that thing is to document it first, to write down the steps clearly so that you can then delegate it or give it to someone else and they can reproduce your result. So it's a real simple formula, but a lot of people mess it up. You know, they try to delegate something before they have clear instructions or clear expectations. 
emotions, or they try to document it and write it down before it's a repeatable process. You know, if you write something down today and it changes tomorrow, writing it down feels like a waste of time. So you've got to go through this kind of gradual process of learning to do something really consistently by experimenting until you feel like you're just showing up and doing it over and over. And then you document it very clearly. So step-by-step processes, which is what our system does. And then you can delegate it or hand that off and have an expectation that someone does it right. Right. I think that that is so important. Again, just in in experience, the lack of that, what happens at startups, right, is there's so much excitement about whatever the idea is or whatever the problem is that's being solved that folks rarely get past the the do it phase of the do it, they go straight, do it, and then delegate. And then they've got a bunch of new hires just sort of figuring it out as they go along. And, and I think you're right. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Also, yeah, they do it, they delegate it, then they have to destroy it and go back to you know <laughs> step one. I think, uh, you, you know, it's, it's every company when they're starting out, they've got to go through this figuring it out phase because no one knows what they're doing day one. You know, unless, unless you're a franchise or a system like that, that's just taking someone else's playbook, you have to create your own. So when you're starting out, you're not working from a manual, you're being creative, you're innovating, you're testing, you're checking your prices, you're switching around your product, your service, you're pivoting. But then eventually when you find some success, it's just repeatable. You say, all right, I I did this yesterday, I'm gonna do it again today, I'm gonna do it again tomorrow. And as an entrepreneur, when I find myself in that position, I feel like I'm just showing up and doing a job at that point because I'm not inventing, I'm not changing things. And so that's that's when when you get that feeling, that's when you know that it's time to write it down and hand it off to someone else because you've solved the problem, at least for now, and it's working, so then you can move on to something else. Exactly. So yeah, so just do it, document it, delegate it works on, on the level that you're talking about. Also, I'm a huge fan of alliteration. So you had me, <laughs> me too, me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you talked about, you know, folks getting to the point where they feel like, you know, they're just showing up for a job. And, and I think that that's one of the things that especially in startups contributes to turnover and, and folks being in and out of, of jobs and, and changing careers. Talk a little bit about how um, this idea of particularly millennials, but certainly any folks in in this in business changing careers and, and the problem that presents from a training and onboarding uh, perspective when it comes to trying to scale something. Well, there's a couple of things. So, I mean, from an individual perspective, if you get bored of doing something, it's just because you're bored, not of the company maybe, but of the role that you have within the company. So when people are stuck in the same position and they leave a company, often it's, time, it's because they feel like they have nowhere to grow. They have no, there's no, you know, if the company's too small, they're not going to get a promotion. They're just sort of stuck at the level they're at. And so they get entranced by some external opportunity of like, oh, come over here and do this. And it's exciting. And, and so they switch companies. But as an employer, you want to keep your team motivated and excited and growing because they're always experimenting and trying new things and they're always growing. And the way to empower people to grow is to get them comfortable with letting go of the things that they do today. So as soon as somebody gets really proficient at something, you've got to have that conversation with them to say, you know, I, I'm sure you don't want to do this forever. So what do you want to do next? And we can, tr- now you're the best person to train the new person on how to do what you're doing today. So I think companies have to embrace their people and, and help, help teach them how to train. So people jumping from job to job though, of course is inevitable. So as a company, you have to have your good onboarding, good training dialed in so that you can get the next person up to speed as quickly as possible. You know, the ideal situation is that when someone quits or leaves a business and you've got that turnover, that you've got someone that can be up to speed, you know, within a couple of days that, you know, and if you had that, you wouldn't be so upset about the person that's leaving. Like, for instance, we had someone that moved to San Francisco, took another job at another company, and we were all happy for her. You know, we're excited that she was leaving. We're sad to see her go as a person. But in terms of what she did for the business, it doesn't feel like she's stealing any of the knowledge of the company because it was all written down. You know, so the next person can get up to speed really quickly. And so people are going to switch jobs. They're going to go after new opportunities. That's what people do. And you have to uh, support that. But it makes it easier to support that if you're giving them the tools to write down what they learn as they learn it. Yes, so much, so much. Yes. What I've seen, the places where I've seen that go wrong, you know, you've got 
this person who clearly doesn't care as much about the job anymore, but they're not going to let this guy go because he kind of holds the keys, right? He or she kind of holds the keys. They know how to do the job and management doesn't feel like starting all over again, uh, teaching somebody else how to do this thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. Or uh, when I was selling into uh, healthcare technology, I would talk to, to these, these women, these nurses a lot of the time, and they'd be like, just absolutely exhausted. One, the, the one person who was trained and really understood how to do this specific job had left. And now they're like, well, you know, Betsy used to do that, but we mm. don't know the process right. that she used. And right. so, so now we're just kind of stuck and it was just like a nightmare. So yeah. So what you're speaking to, I think is, is super, super important. So which kind of it leads into the next sort of piece about bridging the gap between the technology solutions that you set folks up with for success and them actually using it. And what are some of the, the reasons why folks don't and how to, how to maybe make that be a better process to talk a little bit about that for me. Yeah. So a couple of things here, I think, you know, people use a lot of tools in their business and they're resistant. Sometimes I talk to entrepreneurs and they say, Oh, another tool. Like I don't want to sign up for another thing. But you've got to appreciate that all the tech tools that are available today are like cobbling together the this superhuman re- robot employee that you never could have had 10 years ago. You know, so you've got to embrace the technology. So in terms of training, first, employees might not be uh, using tools in the best way if you're not teaching them and, and signing off that they know how to use it. So it's important to say who who owns this tool in the company and then have them write the best practices for how to do it so that instead of everyone trying to figure it out for themselves, you've got the best person figuring it out and teaching the other people to get them to the best person's level. You know, so a lot of times a tool is rolled out and everyone just figures it out individually. And then their competency level is going to be all different because people are, have different levels of tech savviness. So if you make one person the owner and then you get them to write down the instructions and the test or whatever that everyone else has to follow, then you can really have that tech adoption. And then the next thing is there's a difference between doing the work and learning how to do the work. And so we say, you know, doing is different than learning to do. Um, The example I always give is my, you know, I have a four-year-old that's just learning to ride his bike. And because he's gripping the handle so tightly, you know, he has no idea how the bike works. So he's paying so much attention to what he's doing. And we don't even think about riding a bike. We just do it. So there's things in your business like your CRM or your project management system where you're managing the work, you're doing the work. That's where the work happens. But learning to do the work happens outside of those tools. You've got to teach people how to use the CRM or how to use the project management system because the system doesn't teach you how to use itself. And so that's what the difference between training and doing is. And you've got to get your teams up to speed on here is how to use the tools. Otherwise, you can't expect them to be great at it. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any notes or examples on folks you've worked with as far as getting buy-in on that sort of thing? Because I've, I've seen what you're talking about, right? Where, you know, say a team was used to using one CRM uh, or one, one tool for, for prospecting or outreach, and then they get, you know, a new one in place and there's this sort of stubbornness involved. Some folks love it, some folks don't. And then, you know, I've seen it happen where, you know, management just lets, the this if it's one of the senior most people and they don't want to switch they just let them do their thing or oh man or... <laughs> yeah i remember working with one company and the whole company switched to to gmail or g suite and mm-hmm. one one stodgy guy is on outlook and you know they had to set up the whole servers to route emails and he wouldn't get meeting invitations and you know when you let that happen it just it causes the system to break. You know, everybody should be uniform for a reason. So when I was consulting and working with companies, the way I would go about it was you want to interview everyone about the bottlenecks in the process first. So get people to focus on the inefficiencies, the problems, and don't specifically speak to the CRM. You know, what's the problem with the CRM? Because then somebody who maybe picked that CRM is going to feel defensive. But if you start to talk to what are the problems with communication or handoff or this or that, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you get a lot of the team involved, then you can see what the common denominators are. And you can say, oh, it looks like we're wasting a lot of time on this. Does everybody agree? Yeah. And once you get buy-in at the problem level, 
then you can get buy-in at the solution level because you say, this is, this is a new tool I found. Looks like it checks all the boxes. What do you guys think? And then you get them enrolled in picking the solution instead of just saying, here's a new tool we're going to use and jamming it down their throats because then the people that feel really attached to the old tool are, of course, going to butt heads with you. Yeah, that, and that's exactly how it goes, right? So you got these folks who, what we can all agree on in terms of like these sales enablement tools and in, in, uh, this company that I'm thinking of, uh, we could all agree on the fact that it just wasn't working to try and keep up with, you know, sending outreach emails just through Gmail and then remembering to set ourselves reminders. And, you know, so clearly we need a tool that has sequences, cadences. So like you said, once we got buy-in at the, the problem level, like this is the part of the process that if we fix is going to make all of our lives easier, then the tech adoption just sort of naturally naturally follows. Um, so really, really great stuff. And do you have any, anything else that I haven't uh, sort of teed you up for that we haven't touched on with respect to, to this topic that you would want um, somebody who's maybe struggling with this or looking to improve uh, that you want to leave them with? I think the hardest thing in business for anyone is delegation because as soon as you get good at something, you take pride in it and you don't want to hand it off and you think you're going to do it better than the other person and you know it's going to take you less time to do it than to train someone else to do it. So there's this catch-22 in learning how to be good at delegating because you have to force yourself to do it in order to free up your own time to move on to the next thing. And, and that's where people get stuck. So the one thing I would say is anyone listening, if you haven't practiced delegation, if you don't have employees of your own, you should definitely look into getting maybe a virtual assistant or getting some tools, some tech software that can automate some of the things you're doing. When I was interviewing people in my, in my consulting work, um, I used to ask people, you know, if you had a, a secret personal assistant that like worked in a cave under your desk and no one knew they were there. What are the things that you would have them do? And, and it's a great question because it gets people past the, well, you know, my company's not going to hire an assistant for me or whatever, or, and it, and it's also a different way than asking them what stuff don't you like doing? Because people don't want to confess that what they don't like doing for a little bit of fear that they might be replaced or they might not be a fit for the role. But if you ask people, you know, if you had a secret employee, like leaving under your desk or at your house and you could just kind of feed them work so that you could be on vacation more, people will come up with like, Oh, this thing takes a lot of time and I'm always filing these reports and I'm always doing this. And as I would ask people that, I'd get so many good answers that then we could bundle together and say, what would be like a $100 software tool that's out there that could automate, streamline a lot of this stuff? And when the company rolls that out, the people are like, oh my gosh, I don't have to do those reports anymore. It's automatic. That's amazing. And then they're not concerned for their job. They're just now have the, the capacity to move on to, to what's next. So, so I would say practice delegation, ask yourself those questions or, you know, hire a, a virtual assistant of your own and start to get good at it because that will be the thing that helps the most people grow. Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm on board. <laughs> um, so this has really been great. Do it, document it, delegate it. It's a, it's alliteration, like we said, so that's exciting, but also really cool, actionable things that you've talked about with us today. Uh, Chris, how can people who have been listening or who are interested in uh, following your content and learning more from you about this topic and, and some, some of the other things that you talk about, how can they best connect with you to keep up with you? Yeah, best way to find me would be on Facebook or Instagram, just at Chris Ronzio. Uh, for the company, it's trainual, like a training manual, uh, trainual.com. And if you want to know the things to document in your business, we put together a little list of all uh, top 150 areas of your business to start to document, which is an amazing jogger because sometimes you just don't know what you don't know when you're starting out. So trainual.com slash checklist, and you can get those things. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. This was a really great conversation. Thank you. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. 